Uh, I was just saying that flowing from what uh, Vishwanathan said, the mind-brain relationship has become a major area of research. Consciousness research. What is it that creates consciousness? What about altered states of consciousness? Consciousness is not, people used to think it was a static screen against which uh, events happened. But now we find that consciousness itself is dynamic. Consciousness itself is changing. And now with a deep research on altered states of consciousness, whether it is through yoga or through drugs or through any other uh, processes, is really opening up huge vistas of uh, finding out how the brain functions, whether the brain secretes consciousness or whether consciousness pulls out the brain after billions of years of evolution uh, during, during the development of the mind. Uh, these are all very fascinating questions. My own view is that uh, memory, he mentioned memory, uh, you've got to continue to learn. For example, I still remember the poems that I learned at school 65 years ago. I can, I can recite for, for hours, as you know, in all sorts of languages. I don't know how it happened, it's a gift. But it's a gift that I have tried to develop. For example, you may have a gift of painting. But if you don't paint, you will never develop the, your, your gift. Now, it seems that genetically or for some other reason, or Puru Janam Sanskar or whatever, I have a memory which uh, is, is perhaps unusual, and, but it has to be honed. It has to be developed. There must be more recitation. There must be more reading. Why is it that our Shastras, when they start, why are they so evocative? Because they bring about certain, uh, as it were, vibrations in the mind and in the feeling. So uh, I would just like to say, I'm not going to comment upon, upon that area, but I'm just going to say that it is a very, very important area. People like Vishwanath and Anand, who are real, real prodigies, uh, can become very powerful instruments for furthering research on the mind-brain relationship and on altered states of consciousness. And I entirely agree with him that there is a link between the feeling and the thinking. Sometimes the link is not adequate. You, you know, you, you feel something, but you know you shouldn't do it, and nonetheless you do it, and vice versa. But there is a link. Because the totality of human consciousness, I think, includes the body, the mind, the, 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 the emotions, uh, the spiritual dimension, where the human being is a total holistic entity. And unless all of these various uh, dimensions are accessed and developed, you will not get a fully developed holistic human being. So that's just a few comments upon, upon what Vishwanathan said. Thank you so much for being here. I've seen him, well, I haven't seen him before he was born, but more or less when he was born. <laughs> and uh, I've seen him grow up from a very young, the person to become a grandmaster and then to become a world champion. He's a, certainly a role model for many of us. Uh, Anadi Ananta, as uh, you know, is the, uh, is the keynote, uh, the key mantra of this university, seamlessness. So this time, I thought I'd speak about a philosophy, which also to my mind is holistic and seamless. And that philosophy, I think, is considerably in, is of considerable value today when we live in a time of great turmoil and transition. The old is collapsing, the new is struggling to be born, and we find ourselves precariously poised between a disappearing past and an indeterminate future. Around the world as I travel, I notice there's a churning of consciousness. There's great quest for new certitude. And at a time like this, we look into our Shastras, not in order to go back in time. You cannot go back. The arrow of time goes only in one direction. Charei Veti, Charei Veti, as the Vedas say. But in order to try and get the wisdom, the compassion, the courage, and the intelligence to meet the challenges that lie ahead. Always remember, a philosophy is only useful if it helps us today and tomorrow. If it is purely historical, 
or archival, then it's all right for research students. But it does not have any immediacy, does not have any impact upon our daily life. Now, Hinduism has a unique corpus of, of, uh, of wisdom from the dawn of civilization. We have mm, unbroken for thousands of years. We have this, this great tradition. We have the Vedas, we have the Upanishads, we have the Puranas, we have the epics, and so on. And it seems to me that the high watermark of, uh, of our philosophical tradition is what we call Vedanta. And Vedanta, in effect, means the philosophy of the Upanishads. If you, uh, if you look at the Vedas as the Himalayas, then Vedanta are those great peaks bathed in eternal sunlight of wisdom. I just flew in from Nepal two days ago, and I saw many of those great peaks. So the peaks of our wisdom are the Upanishads. And uh, also they're called Vedanta because they come at the end of the Vedic uh, collections. Uh, the Vedas, as you know, are a collection of marvelous hymns and, and utterances by great spiritual souls. And at the end of the collections, there are these great philosophical treatises. They are dialogues. I think it's important to remember that ours is a dialogic civilization. The Indic religions, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, are dialogic. Uh, uh, religions. They emerge from dialogues between the shishya and the student. It's not a revelation where you are given something in one flash and there it is. You can't ask questions about it because it's, it's a one-time thing. But in our tradition, the, there were sharp questions from the students. The Gita is a whole question and answer uh, session. So are the Upanishads. And in the Upanishads, we have the, uh, the, the guru there and one or more disciples, usually maybe a maximum of four or five, sitting around him and asking him questions to which he gives replies. Now, the content of the Upanishads are so rich that it is virtually impossible to encapsulate them. But what I will try and do very briefly is to place before you six seminal concepts which are important, I think, in an understanding of what Vedanta is. And the first concept is the unity of all existence. Isha vasya medam sarvam yatkin jagatyam jagat. Everything that exists, everything that has existed, everything that will exist is illuminated, inhabited by the power of the divine. So the Big Bang, if it took place, was not only an explosion of energy, not only an explosion of light, but also an explosion of consciousness. And so this whole concept of the Brahman, Brahma vidha mamritam purusta, Brahma paschat, Brahma dakshina schotarena, adas chordham prasritam, Brahma vidha vishwamidam varishtam. The Brahman is everywhere, in front, behind, around. Not only this tiny speck of dust that we call planet Earth, but the billions and billions of galaxies in the unending universe around us. Everything, everywhere is illuminated by the Brahman. Tameva bhantu manubhati sarvam, that which shining causes everything else to shine. That is the definition of the Brahman. So that is the first. There is no ultimate dichotomy. The scientists are looking for the unified field theory, a single theory that would explain all the manifestations, or physical manifestations. The concept of the Brahman is the spiritual correlate as a way as a way of the uh, unified field theory. The second important concept is the Atman. If the Brahman is all-pervading, then it also resides in the heart of all beings. All beings, every, everything. But it is only when you reach the human level through evolution that a being comes into existence who is aware of being, who is self-aware, and therefore can become aware of the Brahman that lies within. Therefore, Ishvara Sarva Bhutana Mridesha Ishtari. The Lord resides in the heart of all beings. And all human beings in the ultimate analysis encapsulate a spark of the divine. That's the second major feature of the Brahman. The all pervasive Brahman and the spark of that Brahman in each human being. And the third is fanning that spark 
into the blazing fire of spiritual realization. That process is what is known as yoga. Yoga in the West is now only known simply for its physical exercises, which are very good. But the deeper meaning of yoga is the capacity to join the Atman and the Brahman. And that can be done in many ways. But there are four main paths to yoga. There is the Jnana Yoga, the way of wisdom, the way of discriminative knowledge, the way perhaps of chess grandmasters. There is the Jnana Yoga to distinguish between the real and the unreal. In the West it would be like the dialogues of Plato. You remember Plato told us that we are in a cave and all we see are shadows thrown on the wall of the cave. We neither see the objects nor do we see the light behind the objects. Now similarly in the Jnana Yoga you have the discriminative wisdom to see behind the veil of multiplicity the unity of existence that is everywhere. That briefly is the Jnana Yoga, the way of the discriminative mind. The second major path is the Bhakti Yoga, the way of love, the way of the Sufis, the way of Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, the way of St. Teresa of Avila, or the way of, Saint, of Francis Assisi, the way of Mirabai, the way of Tulsi Das, the way of the Nayan Mars and the Arvars in the south. That is the way of the heart. The heart has to open in love and surrender to the Divine. You have to fall in love with the Divine for the Bhakti Yoga. And therefore, without that, simply with the mind, with the thinking part of our psyche is not enough. We need all also to open the heart, to open the emotions. And that opening of the heart chakra is what is known as Bhakti and it is found in every tradition in the Hindus, in the Muslims, in the, in the Jain, the Sikhs, in every tradition, the Christianity, you have these great bhaktas, these great devotees, people who literally fell in love with some form or the other of the divine. Then you have the Karma Yoga. The Jnana Yoga is the way of the mind, the Bhakti Yoga is the way of the heart, the Karma Yoga is the way of the arms, it's the way of action. Because the Upanishads tell us, you should live here for a hundred years doing karma. Now karma yoga is very important. It doesn't mean doing anything. Everybody does some kind of karma yoga, no big deal. You can't live without karma yoga. But karma yoga means, as it were, placing what you do, offering what you do to the divine. To whatever form of the divine you may be uh, worshipping. If you offer your work as a, as a ahuti as it were, into the yajna of the divine as the Gita says, then that is karma yoga. Yata prithir bhutanam yen sarvam idam tatam so karmanat abhyarcha siddhim vindati manava. We are told that in that power that illuminates the universe, by our offering our works to them or to it, we can achieve perfection. And so the Vedanta doesn't involve simply going away and sitting in a cave in the Himalayas. It involves action, it involves involvement in everyday life, it involves the commitment, but always with a spiritual background before. I am a worshipper of Lord Shiva. Yat yat karma karomi tatatakilam shambho dhavaradam. Whatever I do, I try and offer to Lord Shiva, including this lecture. So the point is that whatever you do, it, wherever you go, if you can have that, that link with, with, with the divine, then the karma yoga is a powerful way of spiritual development. And the fourth path, major path, is Raja Yoga. That is the way of psycho-spiritual practices. Because we are told that within the human body itself there are powers, there are hidden powers that can be developed. There is a Kundalini power, for example, uh, three and a half times around the spine, the base of the spine. It can, be, it can be encouraged to move up the spine. And as it moves up, 
you have a transmutation of consciousness as each chakra is energized until finally it floods into the brain, into the Sahasradhar. So that is one of the points that, that Vishwanathan made, that how do you develop these capacities? How do you develop the memory? How do you develop the power, the energy, the commitment by some kind of Raja Yoga, some kind of breathing practices, whatever. There are many ways. The Hatha Yoga, which is known as Yoga in the West, is very good. But I always say that the capacity to stand on your head is not a condition precedent for illumination. <laughs> If you can do it, congratulations, but you don't have to. So, what, I, what I've said so far is the concept of the all-pervasive Brahman, the concept of the Atman in all human beings, and the fourfold path of yoga, the Jnana, the Bhakti, the Karma, and the Raja Yoga, to join the Atman and the Brahman. And therefore we find that the Vedanta addresses the intellectual, the emotional, the physical, and the psychic element in the human uh, being. Now there are three more concepts that I want to put before you very briefly. One is the concept of the world as a family, Vasudeva Kutumba. If you go to parliament here, I'm not going to talk about what goes on in parliament, that you already know, <laughs> you see it. But if you go to parliament building, on the first gate, there's a beautiful mantra. Ayam nija paro veti gana naam lahu chetasam udar charita naam tu vasudheva kutumbukam. This is mine, that is yours, is a small and narrow way of looking at life. For those of the higher consciousness, udar charita naam tu vasudha eva kutumbukam. The word itself is a family. Because this great, uh, this great concept, thousands of years ago, before science and technology have in fact now made it possible to be global citizens. Today you can take a small machine and talk and your voice is ricocheted off a satellite and goes down simultaneously to the other end of the world. But in those days there was no such technology. And yet they had the wisdom to know that ultimately the human race is an extended family. It may sound a very idealistic thing, but as we hurtle into the global society, unless we accept this concept of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, we are going to end up ultimately destroying ourselves. We've already destroyed our planet to a large extent, and we may end up, well end up, destroying the human race itself. Unless the concept of the world is a family. Mind you, the world is a family, not necessarily the world is a market. You're all uh, sort of Businessmen, so the world as a market is fine, global markets. But a market is essentially an exploitative system, whereas a family is, is, is a, a supportive system. You cannot have a family in which two people are dying of overeating and three people are dying of hunger. If you talk of a family, a family involves equity, a family involves love, a family involves compassion, a family involves understanding. And therefore, when we talk of the world as a family, it is a very profound concept. The United Nations is one aspect of it. UNESCO is another. These are organizations. Ultimately, unless we look upon ourselves as citizens of the world, it will not work. I always feel that that great photograph of planet Earth taken from outer space, the NASA photograph, should hang in every classroom. Because that shows our world as it really is. A tiny speck of light and life against the unending vastnesses of outer space. So beautiful and yet so fragile. This is the earth that has nurtured consciousness up from the slime of the primeval ocean four billion years ago to where we are today. This is Bhavani Vasundara, what the Greeks called Gaia. And therefore, we have to now protect the world. The world has nurtured us for, for millennia. It is now our task to repay our debt to the world. We cannot watch it being destroyed. And so, when we talk about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, we are proud to be Indians, 
but we are also proud to be citizens of planet Earth. We've got to move above simple nationalism into a creative globalization, globalism. That is my view, and has been for a long time. There are 200 nation states in the world. Everyone says, I am right, I am right, fair enough. But you are all ultimately denizens of a tiny spaceship hurtling through space at what, 300,000 kilometers a second. And so this concept of the world as a family is a very important. There's some strange outer space noises coming here. <laughs> but, uh, that's part of the fun, you know, part of the unexpectedness that we should have to about. You must always be prepared for intrusion from mystical <laughs> dimensions. Now, the, fourth, the fifth point is, the, is very important. It is the essential unity of all religions. Ekam sat vipraha bahuda vadanti. This is absolutely crucial. Religion had a, has had a very mixed record in human history. Much that is great, noble in human civilization, art and architecture and, and music and dance and scriptures and learning and all can be traced back to one or other of the great religions of the world. And yet perhaps more people have been killed and massacred and persecuted in the name of religion than in any other name. This is a, a, a very strange and very tragic irony. Every religion thinks that its God is compassionate. I worship Lord Shiva, Karapur Gaurum Karuna Avataram, the embodiment of Karuna, compassion. The Muslims start their prayers with Bismillah, Rahman, or Rahim, uh, the, the divine, full of compassion, full of uh, forgiveness. Jesus mounted the cross because he felt that he was atoning for the sins of humanity. And yet in the name of all these religions, there has been so much violence, it's not acceptable any longer in the global age. Unless there is harmony between the religions of the world, there will never be peace on earth. Even as I talk to you today, there are forces that are using, misusing religion to kill, to maim, to bomb and to destroy. Therefore, I think the time has come when on the one hand we accept the concept, Vedic concept of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that is the watchword of the global society, and Ekam Sat Vipraha Bahuda Vadanti is the watchword of the interfaith movement. I have been involved in this movement for 40 years. Uh, it started uh, in, in a way in 1893 with the first parliament of the world's religions in Chicago. You may recall where Swami Vivekananda also was able to go and he made such an impact. In the 20th century, a large number of interfaith uh, organizations came into being, including one that I had called the Temple of Understanding, and we keep having meetings and so on. But nonetheless, unfortunately, the interfaith movement is still peripheral. We can spend crores of rupees on building mosques and temples and gurdwaras and all. But the interfaith movement is nobody's baby. I think we have to realize that if we want a sane and peaceful global society, we have to develop the interfaith movement. We have to develop an understanding of multiple paths to the divine. Who are we, denizens of a tiny speck of dust in the cosmos, to lay down that the illimitable splendor of the divine can manifest itself only at this place, at, at this time, and in this form. It is a height of hubris. There may be millions of planets uh, in the universe where the divine has manifested. How do we know where it is manifested, how it is manifested? There is no soul-selling agency of the divine. There is no monopoly of the divine. I can say that for me, my path is the best. But I cannot say that because you don't follow my path, you can be killed or persecuted or, or blown up. So the acceptance of multiple paths to the divine is the key to the interfaith hub. It's, these meetings do not, they are not shastras to prove which one is better, which one is worse. They are simply attempts for people to understand. I happen to be chairman of the Rumi Foundation. Now Islam 
because of recent developments, has got a very negative image in many places. But if you go to the great Sufis, if you go to the, the Muslim of Malana Jalaluddin Rumi, you go to the Dargah of Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti in, in Ajmer, you go to Khwaja Nizamuddin here, you will find lakhs of people visit there, uh, regardless of their religion or their uh, what sect they are following. Because in India, we have always given top priority and top respect to the saints. The Hamayu's tomb is half a kilometer from Nizamuddin, Dargah. Hamayu was an emperor of India. Nobody would ever go and, and offer flowers to Hamayu. But you go one kilometer away and you'll find lakhs of people going there. This has been an Indian tradition. It is the saint who has always been respected more than the ruler. And if you happen to have a combination of two occasionally, uh, you, it is unique. So the, the acceptance of multiple paths of the divine, that is the fifth concept I put before you. And the last concept is the welfare of all beings. Bahujana Sukhaya, Bahujana Hitaya. Our prayers are not only for ourselves. Sarve pi sukhina santu, sarve santu niramaya, sarve bhadrani pashyantu, ma kashtitu ko bhagavate. May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings view auspicious sights. May there be no <coughs> hatred between us. Ma vid vishabahe. That is what we have to understand. Particularly the younger people who are growing up. We must get rid of all this nonsense of fanaticism and fundamentalism and, and exclusivism that you see around you. We are proud of our multiple traditions and our individual traditions. And we have to accept and acknowledge and respect the traditions of others. I think that is tremendously important. And when it says Sarve Pi Sukhina, it is not only Bahujana Sikhai, not only the human race, that is why the Vedas had hymns to the mountains, to the rivers, to the, to the, to the um, oceans, because they realized that in the ultimate analysis, if the natural environment is destroyed, the human race would also be destroyed. And Bahujana Sukhaya, Bahujana Etai is, is the best definition of socialism ever. May all beings be happy. We don't try to divide people on religious lines, or on caste lines, or on class lines. We try and involve the entire human race in our uh, uh, attempts to build a better life. And so, friends, taken together, I feel that the Vedanta offers us a holistic alternative philosophy, convergence in place of conflict, cooperation in place of competition, holism in place of hedonism, and an interface dialogue in place of interreligious wars. It gives us a new insight into the world around us. It gives us a certain humility and also a certain sense of pride. If I encapsulate a spark of the divine, I'm not some flotsam and jetsam to be pushed around wherever the wind blows. I have my capacity for judgment. I have my own capacity to decide my future. It may be limited, it may be constricted, but everybody has got a spiritual independence. And that is the most precious thing in life. If you lose that, you lose everything. You can make lots of money, you can become very powerful, but if you disregard that spark of divinity within yourselves, you will, you will lose. Francis Thompson in one of his poems says, not where the wheeling systems darken and our benumbed conceiving soars, the drift of pinions would we hearken, beats at our own clay shuttered doors, the angels keep their ancient places, turn but a stone and start a wing, tis ye, it is your estranged faces that miss the many splendid things. The many splendid light of the Atman. What the Bible calls the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What the Sufis call the Nure Ruhani. What the Sikhs call the Eka Unkar. That light is there. That light is shining around us. That is the light of consciousness. That is why human birth is considered to be so precious. We have to cherish that light. We have to develop that light. And ultimately, that light has to be turned into the blazing fire of spiritual realization. Thank you. <laughs>